I'm ready. Okay. All right. So I am going to light the candle. And uh, can you see the candle? Probably not very well. Thank you. Welcome everyone um, to A Fool's Odyssey. Um, today, as you probably received, we are, we have, um, we're going to be working up through the alchemy card, which is called Temperance, which moves through the dark night of the soul and into what is called the devil and across into death. And this is really powerful uh, because we are moving from the realm of personality to the realm of soul, which is why the journey shifts now. We're ascending. And so Sophia, who has fallen, is now, we are the fool, who is the spirit of Sophia, is on the, she is the anima mundi, and we are now rising. So to begin, um, to keep that in mind, we're going to stand up and do that meditation that we began with again. And so I'm going to push my chair back. So I hope you can see me and you can close your eyes actually if you need to. And um, we will just begin. So if you take a deep breath and let yourself feel your feet become the roots that go ground down into the iron core of the earth and allow those roots to go deeply, deeply into the earth. And then we're going to take a breath and begin to pull that energy upward um, through the, the roots of the feet and back and forth in this beautiful caduceus rhythmic movement that is the serpent path. And as we're moving up through our ankles and through our calves and up through the knees and up into our thighs and into the orange lower chakra um, where we're drawing the Kundalini up through our own what sexuality box and coming up through into the solar plexus. And then take a deep breath as we enter into the golden sphere of the heart and out across our arms. 
and we're extending our arms to draw in on the one side the um, feminine on the left on the masculine on the right our yin and yang and then we're going to draw the energy up through our throat into da so up from tiferet into da and then our shoulders are actually Bina, the great mother, um, on the right side, and the great father, the anima and animus, the great father on the other side. And then we're going to draw the light up into the crown and open the crown. And feel that spark the yod, the spark of the white light come down again and just permeate your whole body. So we're needing heaven and earth within our own bodies as we back into our tree. And we can do this meditation every day as we ground it. Today we are going to be working from moving from the lower chakra, which is the personality, up into towards the heart, the soul. So let's bring the energy back down and we begin. Welcome everyone to class three, um, where we will be working with these, the temperance card, which is 14, the devil, which is 15, and of course death, which is of course 13. I wanted to begin with this today because uh, Jokra Boschart clearly knew his uh, Kabbalah. But if you look at the if you look at the center of the tree, what's really significant at the very bottom, um, we have a little figure who, and then we have the Great Mother. We have the Anima Mundi, the old woman in the center of the tree, and. She is the below. She is the manifestation of the Sophia on earth. She is the anima mundi. But what we are doing right now, do you see that curving around? You see that figure of the feminine with the arrow? And she's moving from the realm of what we call the ego level, the personality level, the astral triangle where we have been. And you see that she's been drawing a moon and moving up. Now this is really significant because the, temper the temperance card, which is called art or alchemy, because it's bringing these two forces, the fire and water together, we'll get more into that, but it is the pathway that's good, that goes from the personality to the soul self, to Tiferet, which is that big yellow sphere in the, in the middle. So it's the wheel. And so this arrow is really interesting because it is about the ascent, but it is also connected to Diana, the huntress. And you can see this arrow going up, which is really important. What we are doing is we're moving to Teferet, which is the soul's seat, seat of the soul and called beauty. And to get there, this is the rising sun of the spirit. We are moving to the transpersonal levels now on the tree. And we've had quite a journey already. It's been a challenge, um, but we have moved through the astral triangle of the subtle body, and now we're moving to a new realm. And this is the moving towards the transcendent function by creating this alchemical uh, coming together of these two sides. And it's also been called the seat of the Messiah because it draws the light sparks into the self. It takes force and energy to reach Tiferet. That's why it's the path of the arrow, the bow and arrow. Um, it takes force or energy to move upward. It's really a, a, a complete, it really is a triptych, the Union Mystica. So I wanted to begin with this because I, I've been, this is really important because some of our work here, and yes, the magician card is, um, can, is Mercurius. And yes, I think Lauren, you had brought this up, um, is, connect, is, is the duplex God. 
but the emerald tablet which is of Hermes Trismegistus who was the source also of Thoth. Thoth is the Egyptian name for Hermes Trismegistus, the god that brought alchemy, astrology, and magic, and is the source of the work that we're doing. And so this is really important, and I'm just going to read it. So true without error, certain, and most true, that which is above is as that which is below, and that which is below is as that which is above, to perform the miracles of the one thing, and as all things were from one, by the meditation of one, so from this one thing come all things by adaptation. Its father is the sun, its mother is the moon. The wind carried it in its belly. The nurse thereof is the earth. It is the father of all perfection and the consummation of the whole world. Its power is integral if it be turned to earth. Thou shalt separate earth from the fire, the subtle from the coarse, gently and with much ingenuity. It ascends from earth to heaven and descends again to earth and receives the power of the superiors and the inferiors. Thus thou hast the glory of the whole world. Therefore let all obscurity flee before thee. This is the strong fortitude of all fortitude, overcoming every subtle and penetrating every solid thing. Thus the world was created. Hence are all wonderful adaptations of which this is the manner. Therefore am I called Hermes the thrice great, having the three parts of the philosophy of the whole world. That is Finnish, which I have to say concerning the operation of the sun something to meditate on. And this is the tree because we are bringing the above and the below together. And so oftentimes I haven't here, um, Mercurius is the God that mediates and Mercurius is of course Hermes Trismegistus. So here we go. Here's an interesting image. I'm afraid I'm not quite sure. Uh, the source of this. This is a, a kind of a very um, sensual kind of earthy image of this energy. And he's got that lion in the center of his belly as the above and the below. And of course the star, which we come back to again and again, because it is a symbol for hum the human. And here she is. drawing down the light. We have worked threes three, because we started, if you re recall, this is connected to Saturn, and we rose from the earth here, the quaternity, the four elements. Through here, we went through the universe or the world to connect to the astral plane, to the subtle body. And then we went across and we worked with these images. These, of course, are from the Splendor Solis, and we'll begin, and we have covered these three in our last class. Today, we are not going to be working with these because we're moving, if you can see my cursor, we are moving from here to here, and from here to here. Like when we had the, and we'll, we'll see that as we go. So, there's our tree. So we've crossed, we've come up from the earth to the moon, to this astral plane, and we did these two pathways, star and the sun. And now we are moving, if you will recall, across this bridge was the tower. It connected the masculine and the feminine, Mercury and imagination and thought. So it was Mercury here on the orange and Venus over here. But what crosses is temperance. And it is temperance that makes the journey that we we're just talking about of the arrow that goes from this subtle body up into the sun. Again, back to Jung, 
and always were dancing between the opposites, between the yin, the yang, the force and form, as the Kabbalists call it, and the masculine feminine. The alchemists saw the union of opposites under the symbol of the tree, and is therefore not surprising that the unconscious of present day man, who no longer feels at home in his world and can base his existence neither on the past, that is no more, nor on the future, that is yet to be, should hark back to the symbol of the cosmic tree rooted in this world and growing up to heaven. That tree, the tree that is also man. In the history of symbols, this tree is described as the way of life itself, a growing into that which eternally is and does not change, which springs from the union of opposites and by its eternal presence also makes that union possible. It seems as if it were only through an experience of symbolic reality Man vainly seeking his own existence and making a philosophy out of it can find his way back to a world in which he is no longer a stranger. Seems interesting for our times. I have a question about the, so you said it's the temperance that lifts into that, the, the center, the golden one that's in the mm -hmm. middle there. Mm -hmm. What happens if I, I see this holding the tension of the opposites? I see this this temperance in balancing the the you the opposites. What happens um, if one ball drops, or what happens if if temperance isn't held? Is that a consideration? Is that is there is there something at stake in the card of temperance? Yes, that is precisely where we are going today with the cards. As we move into the cards themselves, you'll be able to see more clearly. And yes, it is the card for alchemy. And you'll see that more in the thought deck, what they called the artless art, which is the path of personalities to open to the soul. But yes, it is not an easy path because we're having to go through the burning, the fire, the dissolution, the solutio, the whole as we move, bring in little elements of the, the alchemical processes and see if they kind of sit with us and we recognize them through our lives. And of course, these particular, this is from the Rider Waite. And here is their placement. Now, here is that temperance. I, I didn't put the tower behind it. Um, and why this, this card is called the Dark Night of the Soul. Because it is making I and mean, we must surrender the uh, personal will, the personality, self, and desire to the will of soul. And of course, this is what Marion talked about. This is how Marion brought Sophia down often, you know, and um, when she spoke of uh, surrendering to the light, to the penetration of the light. But this is the light that we can receive because the light up here is, of course, the the cosmic world, the archetypal world, and it is the one light. We never come quite up here in body. We can own, this is, this is the Christ consciousness and the Buddha consciousness right here. So this is where we're headed. And yes, it's not easy. Ah. So we're crossing from ego to soul into the philosophical tree and into the realm of the mind, you know, the, the, uh, and the mental. And the angel uh, holds the fire triangle. So let's see. Oh, here's this page. So we can see the triangle. And here again is the middle. This is where we're moving. We're moving from the astral into the ethical triangle. What they call the ethical triangle is the world of psyche soul from the world of the imaginal. Of course, it's all the world of the imaginal. So here you can see the whole thing. You can see the tower behind her. So we've moved through the tower and this is the next card. I mean, where the ego has um, been blasted open, so to speak, by that lightning that came through the crown. And that is the beginning of an awakening. And that's where we were last week. And of course, as many of you noted, um, we were not alone. Um, sun was conjunct Uranus, which is also connected to Mars. So we are in this on a cosmic level but we're also receiving this on a personal level. 
However, on a personal level, we have to be cautious because we have to ground the energy in our bodies. We have to be careful. Our frequency is actually shifting right now and to receive this energy through the crown. So here is the um, Boda Tarot. And the, um, of course, that is the name of God. This is the angel, um, Archangel Michael, who is connected to the soul, the uh, Tiferet itself. And so that the rainbow is uh, significant. Also connected, if you want to do research, to Iris, the goddess Iris. And holding in one, one foot on land, earth, and one foot on water. So balancing the conscious with the unconscious. And we have the lion, which is fire, and the eagle, Scorpio, which is water. So Leo and Scorpio here. And what we and you see the crown above is the lion. And it's interesting that they're reversed. Can you see that? Because the water is being poured onto the fire and the fire is being held over the water sign. So this is alchemy. The other thing is in the center of his heart, he, in this card, he has the symbol, which I actually am wearing. I don't know if you can see me, but it is the symbol for Ishtar, Venus, and in different, called different names. And above that is the name of God, um, which is the Yahe Vauhe. Apparently, that is not how you pronounce it. And if you were able to pronounce it, it would, um, it is not pronounceable except by the initiated, so they say. Um, but once again, behind this card, you can see that yellow road that we saw behind the moon. And it's the same road leading up towards the sun. The alchemical mixture allows the consciousness to go to reach to Tiferet. So things must be balanced and they must be mixed properly. So as we're exiting the personal psyche or soul and going upward toward Tiferet, we are exiting the experience of the personal will. So we're moving from the physical, instinctual, emotional imagination and thinking into the new world, linking ourselves with the Supreme Godhead on the middle pillar. And that's important here too, that we are moving along the middle pillar, which is leading us eventually to the high priestess who is the connecting, the last card that connects um, the crown with the, with the earth and connects to the realm of transcendence. For the Sufis, this is the realm of the angels, the tree of life, the Etzhaim. One meaning is a pattern of, of availability of consciousness to the human mind. From the highest and most abstract to sensate physical awareness in Malkut. So there's a bridge. This is a bridge. So in the bottom of the tree, as we know, we are more familiar and closer to the physical bodies in the lower triangles. That's where we have traveled from the sensation function in Jungian terms to the astral, the world of the lunar, um, which is in Yesod. And now we've also linked feeling and thinking in, in um, the Venus, the Netzach, and the Hod, which is Mercury. This is the intermediate region. And move, uh, Jung spoke of this as moving into the collective unconscious and the beginning of the experience of the archetypes. So through the images, these images, the middle realm images, everything from a higher nature is coming down to us and vice versa. Communications from highest spiritual sources can only reach us through the types and images uh, such as these, because we can't contain the immensity of the archetypal forces, except through our images, our symbols, and through the metaphor. This is the realm of the philosophical, and we're entering the transcendent. So our task is to travel, to find the balance from Yesod, which is the moon, to Tiferet, which is the sun. So key 14 moves between sun and moon, as we already know, on the middle pillar of the tree of life. This is from Robert Wang, the Kabbalistic Tarot, which I highly recommend. It's really an encyclopedia of this. 
According to Robert Wang, it is among the most important and difficult paths of the entire tree, and one on which the very enormity of the great work may be experienced. It has been called the path on which is the dark night of the soul. Key 14 is the beginning of the awareness of the higher self in Teferat, beauty, which is at the center of the tree of life and is called beauty, the sun, and is also, as we said, the Buddha Christ consciousness. It is the heart and soul, thereby the mediator. So why is this then, this path called the dark night of the soul? Does anyone have uh, a sense of that? It seems like you're we're, we're take, like using the negredo or like the shadow material um, into the alchemical process. Well, that's part of it. It's part of it. And yes, certainly when you're going through this, yes, the negredo, you are going through the dissolution, the negredo. But what the negredo is, is a dissolution of the ego, of the will of the ego. And that's a really difficult path, isn't it? I'm looking at it as um, if you have to break down your personality to become, you know, who you are as in psyche soul, that to me would take a really big dark night of the soul as a shock to the system of, you know, thinking or understanding or learning that you're really not who you thought you were. Right. And um, that's what I, I kind of get from this Robert Oring quote. Yeah. So the dark night of the soul is a dissolution of the ego and the ego, the, the personality self realizing, wow, I'm not in control at all. But then who am I? So if I'm not who I thought I was, who am I? And that process of the who am I is the dark night of the soul because we're totally lost, as Dante said, wandering in the underworld, sometimes for years. It's the path of, it's an initiatory path. It's a, it's a very important, they're all initiatory paths, but this one in particular is very challenging. Now I'm going to bring in something else, which I just discovered is that apparently you can take this path, which is the path of the middle pillar, brings those two together. You have choices. You can also take the left-hand path or the right-hand path. Um, they will all bring you back to the same place. And, the, you know, the left-hand path, you know, uh, the devil isn't what we think the devil is. And the, the death isn't what we think it is from the ego's perspective. It's very, quite different. So here's another symbol. Here, here you can see this is from the Rider Waite deck. And it's very similar, but not quite. Because now we have the actual irises um, as opposed to the rainbow. Um, still, one foot on the conscious, one foot on the unconscious and the triangle because we are moving to this other sphere. So by the way, also keep in mind that 14 is five. Okay, I, I didn't do a separate card for that. 14 is five, so hold that. That's the Hierophant. If you want to look at the Hierophant connection to this card. And this is the Thoth Tarot, which I really love because it's really comprehensive. And here you can see that the alchemist is physically transformed by doing the alchemy. So mixing the fire and water. So now the white Scorpio uh, bird has become red and the red, which was the lion has become white. And there is this splitting in a way you can see the beginning of the Cuneuctio. I didn't add one of those images of the Cuneuctio, but some of you may be familiar with that, where there's a splitting as you're bringing the two together, the masculine and feminine, and you're mixing them together. You're mixing fire and water, which also creates steam, and you're transforming yourself through, um, through this process. And at this point, there's also a split between the, the within the self, which will come back together again. So um, I'm actually been going through this for the last year, more or less, I would say. Uh-huh. So this dark night of the soul. Oh, yes. And, yeah. and uh, it's everything you're saying, it's, it's, it completely resonates. So I'm, I'm aware of it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I have a poem that I wrote not long ago that 
maybe it would be nice to share, but maybe I don't know if to do it now or to do it maybe later. Yes, I mean, please share it and share it if you can. Um, you want to read it? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Let's do it at, towards the end. And also, please, please share it online. It's a strange time because what we, when you go through this dark night of the soul in this last year, particularly, it's like a preparation for the work that we are about to, we need to do um, because this journey that we're on right now is the one of bringing life back. And so we have to travel through these dark regions. This is from the Splendor Solis. It's one of the cards. And you can see that this is a ladder. And in fact, the tree of life is a ladder. There are, it's called Jacob's Ladder. There are four ladders because they represent the different phases. We're working with Yetzirah, I believe, which is the air one, which is the mental plane. Um, some of them we can't reach. But you can see here both the, the white birds of the doves, but also the black birds. So we've got this journey that we're talking about um, that we, and you can see the ascent. I mean, this is, this is, this was 1582 that this was painted. So this is the path we're on. We see the world underneath, people getting into the bath. So there's a solution, the solution, looking for the solution. And then this spiral path that leads around the garden. But there is a ladder. The crown is at the bottom. Interesting. This being is climbing up the tree. I think this is related to this particular card. Again, you've seen this image before, but once again, here is the serpent path. And so here you can see from my cursor, we're moving from this lower triangle, the downward triangle. We're in between here right now on the tree, moving up towards Teferet, which is the union of fire and water. We know this quote, wholeness is not achieved by cutting off a portion of one's being, but by integration of the contraries. And I love this one. The pendulum of the mind oscillates between sense and nonsense, not between right and wrong. And I think that's a good one for us to hold right now in these crazy times in which we live, where the pendulum of the mind really is oscillating between these two opposite poles. Perhaps instead of seeing it as right and wrong, we can recognize what makes sense and what is nonsense, because there's plenty of that. Um, so as we're moving into the dark part of today's class, um, I thought this was extraordinary image of the feminine, like receiving, and that's that divine Christ energy at the time, but it is the feminine who is holding both the sun and the moon. There's your Sophia. And from William Blake, down the winding cavern, we groped our tedious way till a void boundless as the nether sky appeared beneath us. And we were held by the roots of trees and hung over this immensity. But I said, if you please, we will commit ourselves to this void and see whether providence is here also. The marriage of heaven and hell. So this is the card we left last week the ego death, the spiritual emergence, the lightning flash of the disintegration. And we move into the devil card, which is not what it appears to be either. Um, so I'm going to speak to this. Um, this is what is called the Baphometic goat. This is the creature that never was. So this is a creature too of illusion. You can see this is a really important card, as it turns out. It is the connection between the mind and the soul self. So it's between Hod, which is the mind connected to the material mind, moving towards the soul. And the star of humanity at the top of his head is pointing downward toward Earth. Um, we have the flower out of the tail of the woman. They both have horns. And the man is holding one is blossom and the other one is the fire. But what's really significant about this, they're chained, they're chained to their egos. Are they though? Because look how loose the chains are. 
this is the bowed deck and it's really significant. The chains are loose. If they wanted to, they could take them off. And again, we have the duplex God, the symbol for Mercurius, right? The Mercury in the center. So I'm gonna speak a little more to this and the card is called Ayin, which means the eye. It's the great eye. It's related to Capricorn. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned the last card is related to Sagittarius. Why? Because the arrow is moving up, as we were saying, and that's the temperance card. This one is related to Capricorn. And what's wonderful about this, of course, Capricorn the goat, it's Saturnian. And the Saturnian piece is interesting because we now know from our work that the Saturn is actually, it comes from Bina, which is the feminine. It's not just the God who eats his children, it's also the feminine, the creator and destroyer of form. And so how do we interact with form? So because this card is on the left side, which is the intellectual thinking function, and that you, it's very challenging to go through letting go of our thoughts to be allowing to, to move into the, the sphere of soul. In the intellectual, the thinking has very powerful thinking function in Jungian psychology. It's a very powerful resistance to the transcendence. Intellect must be transcended. And this is a really, really difficult thing, especially for the masculine side and many intellectuals in our community, because so often the feeling function, the feminine is missing. And we've been leaning very much towards the mind in control. And it has to be science and art together. It has to be the masculine feminine. So here, the intellect itself must be transcendent. So there's an ego attachment to the mind, to knowing, to being really smart. But the knowing is coming without the feeling in this card. So Alan Watts said that, you know, the greatest obstacle to enlightenment is the mind. Why so many people are meditating right now. The mind is ruled by the thinking principle, and the thinking function is a greater autonomy than the other functions. Mind never rests. This was pointed out by Stephen Heller. The mind never rests. I mean, we rest from every, everything else we do. We take breaks from food, from sleep, from everything. We, we quiet our instincts, as he said, whether it's hunger, emotion, sexuality, eventually quiets down. But the mind never rests. So that's why this meditation practice is directed to how to quiet the thinking. Notice he's goat-footed, which is again, goat-footed being Capricorn, being connected to the earth, to taking one step in front of the other. And he's sitting on a half cube, huh? Halfway here and halfway there. The cube, of course, is a cube of, um, that is matter. So there's a sense with Capricorn, it's the Saturnian energy is one where it's very narrow. You know, there, there's constriction. And so the thinking function will try to bar us from moving into that consciousness. Turns out that's a pomegranate, actually. So that's connected to the underworld around her tail. Uh, and of course, they are also goat-footed. So it's oppressive. It can feel oppressive. And it's related to the dogma of the last century and it's related to ideologies dogmas and ideologies and holler makes a connection to hitler's ideology and how you can use an ideology again the mind in service to your will it can be very out of balance now the kabbalists say that there's another very important piece about this card and that is that the card actually means mirth which means laughter in other words, you don't take it that seriously. It's an illusion. And if you can laugh at the devil, it will dissipate. It will disappear. And that's a really important thing for us to remember. That's why, Haller said, that's why the Dalai Lama laughs so much. That's why enlightened beings laugh. And if a being is not laughing, that's a sure sign that they're not in balance. <laughs> right? He does. I just want to say thank you so much for that because that's what I found myself doing was laughing at these cards. It was a very spontaneous thing, but in a way, that's that's what exactly what I felt was, yeah, laughter, myrrh, 
And I thought, wow, that's an odd response. Yes, it's the right response. I really appreciate that validation. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. It's yes. Yeah, so this is how we struggle with what we perceive as evil. The definition of evil is unbalanced force. That's all. Unbalanced force. Now, I'm going to move forward here a little more. There's some more. So a little more on this card. The devil is associated, I've said this now, with the sign of Capricorn and the planet Saturn. The experience of temptation is a necessary path on the journey of individuation and refers to the serpent, the self, the confrontation with the shadow and the illusion of power over nature. It is matter in service to itself and thereby caught in an imbalance. As Saturn is connected to the serpent power of the divine feminine, we confront the limitation of the ego self. So that was just my take on this. And then the other important thing I wrote down here on the bottom, cause I didn't want to forget is note. 15 equals six, which refers to the lovers. And also three times five. In five, we have a number of change. That's the gavura, the severity. It's on the same side of the tree as the devil card. It's on the, on the if you're facing at the left side, if you're backing in on the right side. And the star of the human pointing downward and the chains, of course, on the necks can be removed. They're loose. So we can dispel it. We can laugh at the devil and take off our chains to William Blake. You never know what is enough unless you know what is more than enough. So we all in times in our life go to these places of imbalance. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. Again, the marriage of heaven and hell. So when I was working with this card, it reminded me, actually it was when I was working with the sun and I was like painting the two, the twins, the girl and the boy. Um, and then when I got to this card, I like noticed, you know, it, it was like they grew up and then they switched sides. And I was just wondering if there is a connection between those two cards. That's lovely. I mean, it's a lovely way to see it. I have not, and it makes sense. That's why this is a system of correspondences. So all of you play with it. There are no, there is nothing wrong. You know, and that's exactly, I mean, we were, the, the sun was still in the realm of the, of the personal self, right? And now we're moving into something more serious where we have to grow up and take responsibility for ourselves in the garden. Yeah. So, exactly. So here's the 15 equals six. This is a different card that's also connected because this is the lovers, which we haven't gotten to yet, but I wanted to put it up because you can see the connection between this card and the devil. Very interesting. Um, I have a question as well. Um, Cause yes. you mentioned about yeah. this being ideal and then you brought in Hitler and that I was already gonna ask the question, why are all the people in these cards white with what blonde hair? Well, these don't have blonde hair. True. Why but are they white with blonde hair? Because on, the, it's, <clears throat> sorry. on the other deck that we're coloring, it seems like every person is like the ideal blonde haired, light skinned? Well, I think it's because the cars were painted by white people from the European, from Europe. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> you know, from the West, you know, I, I mean, don't matter. forget that some of the, although these, uh, a lot of, many of these cards were painted in the 18th or 19th or 20th century, they did come from Europe, but you can color them a different color the people, if you like, you know, you can, you can do shades. And basically in terms of whether we have light skin or dark skin or in between, as Michael Mead has said, really, there's no such thing as race. There really isn't such a thing. We are all mixed, no matter how we look on the outside, you know, so you can color them whatever shade you like. Thank you. So as we go deeper into this card, all things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose permits something not to be poisonous. In other words, the dose makes the poison. No. So this is another image from William Blake. The red, I just added because it reminded me of what we're talking about. The great red dragon and the beast from the sea. So we've got the, uh, the dragon of the instinctual self out of, you know, trying to power over the so-called beast from the sea, which could be you know, the feminine, we've got the sword and we've got this flowering. So we've got air, 
I believe that is a wand in one side. So it's intuition and thinking, which is this card. It's the thinking function, trying to move towards the intuitive and um, having to surrender. There are many intellectuals and academics who also are out of touch with the other side. This is a wonderful image, of course, from the Bodha. And here you can see that when he's holding his hand up, which is a Saturn symbol, it's also, of course, Mr. Spock, this Saturn symbol is, again, that we're still in service to the feminine. The devil is not as black as he is painted. From Dante, the Divine Comedy. So again, here, the devil is one that points to the duplex nature of Hermes and the split in the Bible as Saturn is Yahweh, according to C.G. Jung and to Joseph Campbell. It is attributed to the astro astrological sign of Capricorn, the goat, which also signifies Pan, the god of instinctual self, which is the feminine, which we have left behind, nature. The devil is a figure of imagination, illusion, and his attribution is mirth. The devil can therefore be dispelled by laughter. So here's the devil, and you can see the Capricorn symbol, and Ayin is the one at the bottom, which is the eye. And of course, uh, with the Crowley deck, there's always a sexual component to it. And so it's very phallic. And you can see these beings trapped in this lower chakra and the phallus like rising up. But the central eye, the eye in the center of the forehead is coming from the divine. And we can see the spiral pathways. A lot of interference. That's the air part, the interference in the, in the thought deck. So more on this from Collected Works, Volume 9. I have a quick question question or comment about the devil it's yes the materia correct that dark little piece of light in the dark yes there's always that light in the dark yes the prima materia the necessity for this dissolution and you, you kind of see you have to play with this that it's really interesting and it, we're going to move to death of course which that these are these three cards are both pathways to get to the next level to get to the higher level Great. I appreciate the way that you're clarifying that these are pathways that are kind of like choice points even. Yes. Yeah. Thank the you. The right, the left, or the center, the middle pillar. And the middle pillar has been described as it's, it's an easier path. It's the path of the mystics, the middle pillar. And you can just, you meditate and you, you ascend. Whereas these paths, you have to integrate, you know, and you make choices along the right and the left path, hand paths, which is the path of the occultists. And it's the serpent path that we're on right now. It's also the path, in a sense, of the feminine, because we can tolerate that back and forth, the kundalini. So in this, Jung says, it seems as if the development of the feeling function in Western man forced a choice on him, which led to a moral splitting of the divinity into two halves. Thanks to the development of feeling values, the splendor of the light God has been enhanced beyond measure. But the darkness represented by the devil has localized itself in man. The devil was largely, if not entirely, abolished with the result that this metaphysical figure, who at one time was integral, an integral part of the deity, was introjected into man. We think that the work of darkness has thus been abolished for good and all. Nobody realizes what a joining this is of man's soul. So this is really important because, of course, Jung's referring back, you know, in his connection to Nietzsche, that we need both, that God is not good and evil. God transcends both, that the divine brings the two together. And anything that is out of balance is going to be evil. And Jung is repeating this. I mean, Heller is also a Jungian. Um, so this is really important that when we acknowledged that pan, that nature was part of life, before Sophia was, the goddess was exiled from the earth, then, I mean, we as women became the devil. 
because we were uh, the the feminine was completely abolished and perhaps this is our time of the return but very interesting quote here by jung the splitting of the divinity into two halves and here's the the man is the star And again, from this is uh, collected works. Again, this is volume 11. It is a psychological rule that when an archetype has lost its metaphysical hypostasis, it becomes identified with the conscious mind of the individual. Since an archetype always possesses a certain numinosity, light of the divine, the integration of the numen generally produces an inflation of the subject. In recent times, this type has extended into the field of political psychology and its incarnation in man has had all the consequences that might have been expected to follow from such a misappropriation of power. And I'm going to give a personal example of something I crazily did this week. There's a very renowned scholar of Jung who is about to publish a book. And I'm not going to name it because this is recorded, but he did a video of his book and he is completely identified with his, not his intellect, and with, he believes in a sense that he's the heir apparent to Jung's understanding. And it's exactly what Jung's saying here, that he clearly went through a very a dark night of the soul, but he's, in, he's inflated. The ego is inflated. Now, it's so sad when our work with Marion, when we were studying uh, Jung and Zarathustra, that that actually also happened to Nietzsche, that that's how he fell off the balance beam and he went insane because he, he identified with the archetype. So when you identify with the archetype, it will possess you. It will take over. It's too much for the human to identify. We have to remember that even though we experience the download of the archetype, the numinous experience, which is what I call a full body experience and every level, we also have to keep in mind the humility. And of course, we're seeing that in our political situation. And then again from Jung, for the alchemist, the one primarily in need of redemption is not man, but the deity who is lost and sleeping in matter. His attention is not directed to his own salvation through God's grace, but to the liberation of God from the darkness of matter, the liberation of God's grace from the darkness of matter, from the prima materia, the negredo. And the deity who is lost and sleeping in matter is Mercurius, the mediator. You've seen this image before about the shadow. Does somebody have a question? Yes, I have a question. Um, from, my, from my own experience, actually, when, when you are falling into inflation, many times a dream will remind you um, that uh, you are going too far. Um, That's right. Is that your experience too? Yes, the dream will always bring in the unconscious point of the, the a different point of view to rebalance, definitely. Yes, because that's what the dream is, isn't it? It's, a, it's, it's bringing in a con what Jung called compensation. It's a place where we're out of balance. It's going to bring in the other side. Yes. So every man carries within him, through life, a mirror, as unique and impossible to get rid of as his shadow. A very sad fool. To find out what is truly individual in ourselves, profound reflection is needed. I've used this quote before, but it's so important. And suddenly we realize how uncommonly difficult the discovery of individuality is. Because we're always confronting ourselves. We're always bumping into ourselves. And that's what our journey here is about, right? It is a fool's journey because, you know, we are all the fool. And as Blake said, if the fool would persist in his folly, he would become wise. This is something Marion so often repeated. And we are all the fool. And as that, we are constantly having to reflect. And the dream is a, is a source of profound reflection if we work with our dreams. Here we go. Surrender, surrender. <laughs> and so now we're in the card of death. And so I'm going to speak to this some more. 
Um, this is the 24th path and it's the card 13. It's Scorpio, it's related to Scorpio. And the interesting again is called Noon, which is a fish. So again, we're going down into the depth here. This path is on the other side. And because we're winding around and the devil path was connected to Hood, which is Mercury, which is thinking, this path of, of death is the connection point between Netzach, which is Venus, which is the feminine imagination, not the thinking. From the imagination, we are moving towards the sun. And so it's a more peaceful path, according to Huller, than the devil. And it's asking us, how do we, he says, surmount the force of imagination to overcome? How do we cooperate with the process of alchemy, the alchemical process of death, of allowing our emotions and our projections to go away and die? And this is really, it's more gentle, but it's not easy. It's desire. Don't allow the complex to be energized to step back and say, okay, I've got this complex. I feel like I'm totally infatuated or I'm caught in this old complex, whether it's mother, father, lover, child, I can't disentangle myself emotionally from this energy. The ego, of course, always wants to survive no matter what. And yet it is finite, which is the problem. So eventually it must die. It wants to feel alive. And so to extricate ourselves from this emotional self, and to move towards, again, towards the soul self. We need to allow to grow into the spirit. Now, Heller does this lovely thing here, which I'm reading from, where he talks about the lotus, the lotus or the rose. The lotus has its roots in the mud, and it blooms into the air. So it's such a beautiful image, you know, because it's coming out of the depths of the earth and growing upwards into that place of love, because, of course, the lotus is also of love, as is the rose in the West. So there's more here by Jung. So by descending into the unconscious, the unconscious mind puts itself in a perilous position for it is apparently extinguishing itself. This is wrong. It should be the conscious mind puts itself in a perilous position for it is apparently extinguishes itself. We're actually doing an ascend in this, um, not a descend. Um, and this is from psychology and religion. Now we're moving forward into this alchemical piece that we're talking about, the part of the negredo is the dismembering. The victim in the dismembering, the victim corresponds to the idea of dividing the chaos into four parts. The purpose of the operation is to create the beginning of order. Now four parts we know is always, always connected to the quaternity, air, fire, earth, and water, the lion the, for uh, Leo, Scorpio, Aquarius, and Taurus. So the purpose of the operation is to create the beginnings of order, the psychological parallel to this is the reduction to order through reflection of apparently chaotic fragments of the unconscious, which have broken through into consciousness. Sometimes this comes in through dreams. Um, we'll be talking more about four paths as we go up because Huller refers to, we'll be moving to the two sides of the tree. You, I'm sure you've noticed there are four on the two sides, there are pillars that are not connected to four cards, I should say, the four keys that are not connected to the center. But we're still here in the Negredo, and we can see here this breaking down. I mean, this is the prima materia broken down. Cutting off the head is exactly the cutting off the head of the devil. It's cutting off the head of the intellect of the old way. It's like, oh, I am not who I thought I was. Who am I then? So we must cut off the thinking and to allow this transformation. So again to Jung, Jung says, death is an interim stage to be followed by a new life. No new life can arise, say the alchemists, without the death of the old. They liken the art to the work of the sower who buries the grain in the earth it dies only to waken to new life. Beheading is significant symbolically as the separation of the understanding from the great suffering and grief which nature inflicts on the soul. It is an emancipation, a freeing of the soul from the trammels of nature. Its purpose is to bring about a unio mentalis in the overcoming of the body. 
So does that make sense in terms of where we are on the tree right now? That this great loss, this great grief is necessary in a sense. It reminds us that and allows us to separate from our identification even with that because we, we are so much more. So again, the Splendor Solis, this is from the seven parables. He's cut off the head, the hand, the two arms, and the head of the old God makes room for the new. And look all around the edges of this card. Again, this was from 1582. Is nature emerging, blossoming? And such an appropriate card for this moment in our time. Now, this is the Rider Waite deck, and it's a very different view of the death card because he's dressed in armor. He's armored with the white rose of purity. So he's, as death is riding through, the people are falling down and dying. I mean, the old god, that's the old king. The old king's dead. The child is looking, is looking up at death. And the bishop has also, the, all the old rules, the old dispensation is falling but on the horizon i'm going to move forward is the rising sun so this is from paracelsus death is the midwife of very great things it brings about the birth and rebirth of forms a thousand times improved this is the highest mystery of god from the devil's doctor paracelsus and the world of renaissance magic and science and i was waiting for this card because in this card, you can see the sprouts coming up, even as the old has been cut away. And that's the rising sun in the background and the white rose. And from Plato, I've shared this one before, I know. No matter how hard you fight the darkness, every light casts a shadow. And the closer you get to the light, the darker the shadow becomes. And this is exactly what this particular pathway that we are navigating today, where it took us into this place, that as we get closer, as we ascend the tree, as we move up towards consciousness, the shadow becomes darker. And this is the red man rising. This is also from the Splendor Solis. This is the beginning of the Rubedo, the new life or the promise of new life. You can see the stags and the birds and the, all these creatures, the flowers. And this is another from William Blake. Again, the great red dragon, which is this transformational, the dark and the, and the woman clothed with the sun. So you see the feminine rising out of the center, the sun again being to ferret, beauty. And she's opening her arms to receive. We'll see this image again in the strength card. And going back again to uh, remind us that 13, which I didn't mention, is four. So 13, the death leads us back again to the quaternity, to the feminine, to the earth. So that transformation of the 13 becomes four. Now, isn't it interesting that in our culture, 13 has been considered an unlucky number. And again, perhaps it harkens back to that idea that the feminine has been exiled. And when she returns, she returns as a quaternity, the cube. But here we see the two coming together and merging. How does that correspond with the four emperor card? It does correspond to the four emperor card. And how does it? Because there's more to work with there. Because the emperor is connected to Aries also of fire, but he's very grounded. He is sitting on the cube of space. So in a sense, I love this because, well, we'll get more into this because the three is the empress and the four is the emperor. And he grounds the energy in a way right? He's solid. He's sitting. He's, he is, even his stance is one of the cube. So it's good to meditate on these as you're going through them. It's good to meditate on how the numbers work, the threes and the fours. The emperor is four. He is related to this. It's a new dispensation. 
the reason I have the star card back here again, which is 17 and we worked with last week, is again, we see the same energy of one foot in the conscious and one foot in the unconscious. Balancing both. And here's a old image of the tree here. And some of you have seen this, but I wrote something, so I'll just read it. It related to my own dark night. <laughs> there is a point in each of our lives when we have been hanging on the edges of a worn tapestry by our fingernails for so long, we hear the final threads tearing as we fall into a seemingly eternal bottomless abyss. We have been striven until we are torn in two by fear, despair, grief, without hope. Here all we have believed has failed us. We find ourselves in an utterly alien landscape. Where then do we turn for solace to find a path back to home, to ground, when self as we have known it has dissolved and disintegrated? Like the process of chrysalis, the caterpillar knows its way through the cream, green leaves it chomps and finds itself creature no longer, nothing. The way back then must be through imagination, prescribed by symbols as they appear in nature and within psyche. The tension of the opposites, a metaphor of crucifixion is more than metaphor. It is the Newman living in itself through body and soul. When we are torn between two opposing poles without resolution or hope, then the only way through is a third transcendent reality, not even imagined, and only longed for beyond hope. So here is the, again, from the Splendor Solis, the black sun. And this is where we are as we arrive and we will be moving in next week into that sun that is the in-between. It's the rising sun, but we're still in the darkness. And again, this from Jung, the difference between the natural individuation process, which runs its course unconsciously, and the one which is consciously realized is tremendous. In the first case, consciousness is nowhere, nowhere intervenes. So you can go through an individuation process in the unconscious. The end remains as dark as the beginning. In a second case, so much darkness comes to light that the personality is permeated with light and consciousness necessarily gains in scope and insight. The encounter between conscious and unconscious has to ensure that the light which shines in the darkness is not only comprehended by the darkness, but comprehends it. That is the reflection. The filia solis a lunae, the sun of the, the sun of the sun and the moon, is the possible result as well as the symbol of this union of opposites. That's the third. It is the alpha and the omega of the process, the mediator and the intermediates. It has a thousand names, say the alchemists, meaning that the source from which the individuation process rises and the goal towards which it aims is nameless, ineffable. And when we arrive at that, as we're moving up the tree, the words do start to fall away. The numinous experience is not one that we can describe in words, whether we're in the underworld, where there's no language, or whether we're ascending and we are struck by that arrow. And that arrow of love is what takes us upward. So here's Mercurius again by Jofra Boschard. Um, messenger of psyche, mediator between spirit and matter. And without this energy, even though he is a duplex God and he is the God of alchemy, he is bridging heaven and earth. And you can see in the background in this card too, that divine light coming through the top of his head. And very faintly in the background on the left is the great mother, the anima, holding the, the chalice, the cup in her hand with the moon overhead and very vaguely, perhaps even cut off on the other side is the solar, which is the great father, the animus. It is all these two that are coming down the tree. I mean, it is all the great father and the great mother in different forms dancing together, going down the tree and up the tree. And here 
is Mercurius mediating it. And here's another Jofra. And I really love this image because you can see that stretch. This is what we did today. This is that stretching. We moved from the lunar realm, reaching up into the solar realm. And again, we can see on the two sides. It's interesting that he has the feminine painted with a time where he has a circle above his. And she is crossing her arms and her heart holding the energy. She is, because she is connected to time, because she's Saturn, whereas he is pointing towards this energy. And this being is rising out of the dragon, the pit. The dragon is the unconscious, the unconsciousness, the serpent, and rising up above the lunar and reaching towards the veil. This is the high priestess. She is behind it. And you can see the veil as the veil that is parting. And that is the definition of apocalypse too. It's the parting of the veils and the crown is opening. I mean, we certainly are in apocalyptic times. And this is our task. And this is just a little bit here from Marion. I do believe we all have a destiny. We either live it or we escape because we're afraid to live our own reality. I feel blessed. I didn't really have choices. I have been forced through dreams, through my body responses, through illness, to surrender. The surrender feels like death. If you're going to live your full soul's journey and find the spiritual dimension, you're going to go this way and surrender the old life to the new. I do not see surrender as failure at all. I would have simply died if I hadn't seen that in the death was the birth of a whole new consciousness. Here again is this beautiful piece by Nicholas Rorich, which someday I hope to see, of the Divine Feminine. And you can see behind her the three, the three, the three circles and all the sparks around her. So this is an image of the mother of the world, who is Sophia. Sophia landed in the Anima Mundi. It seems to be appropriate for this poem from T.S. Eliot's I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope. For hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light and the stillness, the dancing. Let's hear, let's hear Marcella's poem. Okay, so um, it's originally written in Spanish, which is my mother tongue, but I will translate uh, just more or less uh, in the way. So it, it goes like this. Now I know what an initiation looks like. The terror of leaving who I was and go down and down and down, layer after layer of skin, deeper and deeper. Face terror, resistance, panic in every cell and go even deeper. With my only compass in the darkness being uh, that I know that others have made the trip until the bones before me and they have been only skeleton and they have sung and they have seen flesh be born again 
and the only compass this like tiny light deep inside that tells me that this is truth that that this is what i have to do in the middle of sacrifice of who i was in the middle of terror of living uh, um, layer after layer of skin now i know what an initiation looks like like feeling in a never-ending birth canal with an unsure perspective uh, of being born in an unsure future for which I can only pray. This is initiation. Hugging again and again, opening my heart and hugging terror, resistance, fear, loving them as better as best as I can in the middle of darkness. Wow. So sorry, translation, it, it's, it's just difficult. <laughs> no, it <laughs> was, it was more or less. <laughs> no, it was beautiful. Thank you. And of course, totally perfect. Thank you so much because that was really the perfect ending to, uh, to this, to this, and to this journey that we are all on. I'm really deeply moved. Thank you. So on that note, let us move into Do This Dance. Darkness, cover me like a blanket of night. Oh, cover me lightly. Shadow. Gather around 